Hey, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're here this morning to talk about creating grant budgets. Uh, or I guess I probably should have made it creating proposal budgets, but uh, we're excited to do this today. This is the third of our webinar series. The other uh, recording should be up and available. I'm Carla Howell. I'm the research and grant writing content expert for the University of Louisiana System. I'm also the Director of Purchasing and Sponsor Programs Administration at Northwestern State University. I have joining me today as my co-presenter, Ms. Debbie Benoit. I'm going to let Debbie introduce herself. Thank you, Carla. Um, good to join you today and welcome to everyone. Uh, Debbie Benoit and I am the Director of Research and Sponsor Programs at Nichols. Okay, we'll jump right off into this. We are here to discuss the grant budget, and we're going to go through today the budget categories, and you're welcome at any time to put in the chat or the question and answers. If you have some comments, some thoughts, uh, if there's a particular question you want us to address or win that budget category, we'll may get at the end or we'll come back to it. But each budget that you have to prepare with the proposal <laughs> For the most part, they all follow the same uh, categories of expenditures. I'm going to start out with the personnel budget. That's usually a big one. A lot of your federal grants will allow personnel to be included in those, and it's it can go many directions. Um, when you're looking at your personnel, you want to a lot of times have to calculate your faculty sal salaries if you're doing it through the summer, uh, may cover your summer school salary, and all these are include various calculations. You can have, if you're doing an hourly person, a research associate, we call it here wages of labor. Um, you said it's an old civil service term and we bring them in on those. With those, you'll have different things that apply there. Fringe benefits is a uh, cost to the university. And we'll discuss that in a little more detail. When you're doing your proposal, there's always going to be a time commitment that it takes to administer the program once it's funded. And many of your agencies will provide funding to support that, or they ask you to include that as match in release time from your university. When you're figuring in these salaries, you want to be sure that you in, in include everything that's going to be included, all the costs that are associated with the university. So therefore, if you calculate a salary, you're going to have related benefits or fringe benefits, as it's called. This is the university's cost of your, the university's part of your retirement, the university's part of your health insurance. If it's an hourly person, you're going to have FICA or Social Security and Medicare. The university has to match the Social Security. So these amounts have to be included in your grant budget um, as part of the uh, request that you're asking for. Student uh, wages, student labor is also can be included um, at Northwestern. When we have student labor in there, it has to generally go at the specified rate unless we assign them as a special wages to labor position. Our students, when they're not currently enrolled, do have fringe benefits, do have the Social Security and Medicare charged on there. If they're an enrolled student, of course, there's no related benefits charged there. Debbie, you want to add some? Yeah, I, I'm going to start off by saying that um, as a disclaimer, every university does some things a little bit different. You know, we don't always follow the same guidelines and policies. Um, in general, we do. I mean, there are state and federal policies that we must follow, but we all do things a little bit different. So when I speak, I'm going to be speaking from how we do things here at Nichols, but know that it may not apply necessarily to your university. You need to look at your policies and practices. And I'm sure each um, uh, institution, as we do, have a, um, a handbook uh, of sorts or a website that allows you to go in, peruse the different rules and regulations. Um, uh, many of our faculty would rather call us and ask us instead of looking at the website, which that's fine too, but, um, but it is there if you uh, so decide to pursue that. So I, I'm going to talk about the equipment or acquisition part of the application, and here's where um, it might be a little bit different. Um, our university says 
anything um, over a thousand dollars is equipment. If you're if you're dealing with a federal grant, they will tell you anything over five thousand dollars is a um, equipment purchase or an acquisition. So that becomes a little bit complicated. And the way we resolve that here is that we ask for an internal and an external budget so that um, it helps the controller's office when they're um, you know, uh, managing the budget to know where the, where, what line items these things follow. Uh, it, it, it's just, it has ended up being easier that way to, to manage. Um, but any items such as a computer, uh, a kiln, electronics, property costs, library acquisitions or machinery that are over a thousand dollars is usually placed in this category uh, for for our purposes. Um, you estimate the cost of each item or piece of equipment by using catalogs or a telephone or written quote, we prefer this. Um, and for us, and this is not always the case with everybody, but our people want the shipping cost included in that cost. We don't want a separate line item for shipping. So all of that has to be one estimate under the equipment. Um, all state agencies are also obliged to follow bid laws. Um, and there are things called split orders. So for instance, it's not, um, or rather it is illegal to avoid taking comp competitive bids when the total of the purchase exceeds $5,000. Um, so um, when you request a vendor to um, bill you for some merchandise on an invoice, um, it has to be that you have some sort of bid if it's, if it's over a, a 5,000. For instance, um, the vendors who are not on state approved contract lists um, always have to provide um, what they call a quote order and these competitive bids must be taken. Um, usually that happens um, through our purchasing department. They handle uh, those bids and the departments must provide detailed specifications and, and even suggested vendors. Um, if you purchase these items on the state vendor approved list, you don't have to do that. You can outright purchase this. Um, there are three ways to do quotes. There's a telephone quote um, or a fax quote, and um, there's invitation bids and there's um, bid acceptance. And each one is a little bit different depending on the amount. So you can do the telephone and fax bids with anything over $5,000. The invitation or bid and acceptance, anything between 15 and 25,000. And then the bid acceptance has to be 25,000 or over. So all of these details I'm sure is provided to you through your sponsored program office, but, and I'm not gonna get into the real nitty gritty about all of it, but I'm, I'm sure you can get those additional details on your canvas. And Debbie, this, this form you're talking about where you do a comparison, the, the grant budget to the university budget, I recall doing that several years ago. I'm be interested in you sharing that form. That may be something we'd share with our other institutions if uh, and we can see. And I see we have some of our other sponsored program directors on here. So as she said, and I can't, I'm gonna say it again, reach out to your sponsor programs office to help you during this process. There are so many things that you can straighten up in the proposal process within your budget that'll alleviate problems if it's funded. It's a lot easier to set it up in a way that'll flow through versus, and something else you mentioned, once that funding comes into the university, it's considered university money, has to follow all the state rules and regulations. You may talk to an industry out there and they tell you, we're going to give you $25,000 to buy this particular piece of equipment. It, once that money comes in here, we've got to follow the state rules and regulations. 
Um, at Northwestern, same thing, over $1,000 is tagged as equipment, 5,000 with the federal, of course, and over 30,000, you have to go out for like sealed bids. And yeah. so we, we've got it, everybody, like she said, we each have our own policies. Um, we, you know, we direct you to that. We use those regularly, but on the on the front end, set it up right, find out what you need to know. And I I was remiss in missing that in the personnel section. If if you're going to have people in, talk with your HR folks, your sponsor programs office. Make sure you're putting those individuals in the right category, using the correct fringe benefits rate. Most of us have that posted on our sites. Oh, and the other thing that I didn't mention, I, I, we have split orders there. You can't circumvent these laws and rules. So in other words, we talked about the $5,000 requirement. You can't order 3,000 from one vendor and 2,000 for another. And that's basically called a split order. You have yes, to put it all together. It's your auditors will come in. You're right. It has to be, um, it has to be bid. I've had them try to circumvent, you know, come to me wanting to say, well, what if we're uh, doing a contract? We do this much of it this month and the, the rest of it the next month. Can we do set two separate yeah. contracts? Yeah. <laughs> we do not do that. We've got to put it all together and follow those rules. Right. Okay. And I'm going to talk about travel and travel. Once again, you may put in your budget that they will pay $400 a night for a hotel room in New York City, but that's not going to happen. You've got to follow PPM 49 in accordance with all the state of Louisiana travel rules and regulations. Here, my travel office is right down the hall. So if someone comes to me and they're doing a proposal and, and they're trying to lay it out, I ask them with travel and, and to be as detailed as you can in a general way. Don't push yourself into a corner with your with your travel numbers um, on a grant budget. Now, you know, some are flexible, but some, whatever you send them, you've got to follow just that or go through a lot of approval processes. So we first and foremost, you know, follow PPM 49. Um, that's going to tell you everything that you can cover. Uh, if there's, there's registration fees included, if the registration is with the travel, it's handled one way. If you've got to do the registration ahead of time, sometimes that's handled a different way. Look at your hotel, your mileage rates, uh, your per diems, some meals, they'll all cover this. Of course, travel here, I'm sure like everywhere else, has gotten minimal now. We all do everything this way. We travel through <laughs> our computers which has been a good cost savings for some of us, but it also, you're, you're missing, you know, part of that. So we want you to continue to travel. And sometimes with your research and your sponsor projects, you have to travel, you have to go on location. Um, so just, you know, know what your travel rules are. There's always PPM 49. I may come across, I'll put a link in the chat to you to that. But your universities are going to have that on their page and in their, in their regulations for you to follow. Debbie? So when it, yeah, so when it comes to material and supplies, uh, again, um, if it's state, it's under $1,000. If it's federal, it's under $5,000. So we're, we're at that crossroads again in dealing with that. But I'm going to uh, 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 agree with what Carla said about not putting yourself in a corner. Um, you do the same with materials and supplies. You know, our controller's office basically use is the budget like a prescription. So if you are, if you say, for instance, that you want a HP laser color pro M404 printer, and then you end up getting something else, they may deny it. You know, you, when you're talking about supplies, we realize that this is mainly consumable items. This is not something that necessarily needs to be tagged. Um, so you can say things like color printer, color laser jet printer, don't name the, the brand necessarily. Um, file folders, paper, office sundries, miscellaneous, uh, all of that is acceptable under uh, supplies, materials and supplies. Now, I know uh, some of the biology folks get, you know, uh, test tubes and, you know, different specific things, but again, they don't care 
you know, the brand name or you know, the company that you're ordering it from. They just need to know a general listing of what to look for uh, when the supply um, uh, comes in. So um, I, I think that's really all. You don't really have to be, uh, like I said, very detailed with this uh, item. One thing that Debbie Omashi, how do y'all handle like this has come up a lot over the last several years. If uh, if a grant has money for iPads and you've got participants and they're going to hand out the iPads, I know that all of us run into that. I mean, you can't just give the participants these iPads. You've got to have some type of checkout process. And how are y'all handling that, Debbie? Um, usually we put that in the grant. That's usually designed. We need to say how secure we're going to be with the equipment and what the process is. And especially if we're lending it out um, off campus, there needs to be a, a complete um, plan for that. And it's usually spelled out in the, in the narrative. So, and we follow that again, and we make sure that they adhere to it in the implementation stage of the project. And like, it's, yeah, so it is doable, but just know that it, it does involve a little extra monitoring and tracking because you are dealing with state funds and we can't just, you know, buy those and give them away. I know it, sometimes we have a, a little bit of a hardship explaining that. Um, and it, it is unfortunate in some cases, but that's one of the things. Usually we make um we make the participants sign some sort of an agreement, you know, saying that you know they're liable if they don't say damage or um, destroy the piece of equipment. There's some sort of penalty, basically. That's it. Okay, your your operating services, uh, other items. I'm going to touch on operating services first. That's going to be. Uh, your printing, your um, postage, things like that. A lot of times these type of items are included in your indirect cost. You may not necessarily have them in the budget. Now, if it's specialized printing, your printing brochures, pamphlets, things like that, yes. But just general office type supply things that are used in or office type services, I guess I'd say, are gonna be part you know, your indirect cost because You've got your utilities and things like that that would come under that brand. Professional services is something that you'll see a lot of. You'll have uh, consultants that you bring in. You'll have evaluators that you bring in. And a lot of times the universities handle these in different ways. This is another thing that you'll need to check with your sponsor programs office on. If you've got professional service contracts, there's certain guidelines that you have to follow there. Uh, over 2,000, over 5,000, depending on the type of service that it is. Sometimes there's a little bit of a gray area between what's considered an operating service and what's considered a professional service. So certain types of things you may can uh, do on a purchase order with just a, as an operating service. But if it's an individual that's going to have to get a 1099, that's going to go through a professional services contract, depending on the nature of the work and how things, there, there are a whole, it's a whole nother session we could go in with that. Subcontracts, if you're going to have a subcontract, if you're going to be subcontracting some of the money that you have coming in, then you're going to have to have a budget from that subcontractor. We ask, we ask here at Northwestern that you get us a proposal. They've got to have their part in the proposal. They've got to have their full, full budget and all their expenses covered. And then we have a separate, which we use the state's subcontract form or contract form that we turn into a subcontract form to use between us and that entity. If you're doing it within state, it keeps it clean. But when you start sending money out of state, you've got a lot of guidelines that you've got to take note of between your institution and the institution that you're subcontracting to. Everyone doesn't follow Louisiana's laws and sometimes it can get a little sticky on getting those things straightened out. But be sure to check with your sponsor programs office. If you have a contracting officer on your campus, which I, I, I know that some of the uh, tech may, uh, ULL may, I think that they use for those type of things. And then matching and cost sharing and buyouts, that could be a whole session in itself. I think I'm looking into doing that because there are so many questions 
that come up with that because there's so many variations. We have a large proposal right now and we have 15 partners in it that all have cost sharing in it. And we're discussing, you know, how is this going to be handled? We have a on our internal routing form, we have a the page two is the cost sharing and matching part of it. And we make they have to identify it by category. You have to identify the source of it. The budget unit head for that source has to sign off on that page attesting that they have that funding available or they are allowing that percentage of time for this proposal or they do have funding in their budget that's going to cover what's being asked for or what's being projected in the matching part to, in order to do the project. Uh, that can get, um, that's also can get to be a very complicated area. Our policy here, if the funding agency doesn't require matching, don't put matching. We do uh, too. <laughs> you can mention it in your narrative, um, the university is supporting our project, but when you put it in that budget and in that budget justification and you are specific that we're going to do this, then you have to do that. Uh, it's, um, it's a highly audited area also. And the agency, if they're going to give you 100000 and you've got a 10% match, you're matching 10000 and you only spend 6000 of your amount, then they're all, they, they can only give you 60000 mm -hmm. So you've got to watch that. You've got to watch it close, spend some time with your uh, budgeting folks and, you know, look at what you're doing and make sure it is something you can attest to. Space is generally an easy one. We get square footage amounts and we can put that in a budget as a match because that's you know something's going to be there no matter what you know we have our indirect cost rate our overhead negotiation we'll get to that next but a lot of times some of that is covered we use our indirect cost as matching on grants for a good bit just you know because that's our offices and your your basic service office on campus that are involved in the projects Debbie, I know you've got some more you can throw in here on match and cost sharing and buyout. I guess I should have well, spent more time with the buyouts. <laughs> you know, that's that's another thing. I think that universities do differently, uh, not necessarily uh, call things the same th way. The in kind for us means anything that is not paid for. If a, if a faculty member uses their time, and that's considered their time being paid for, and we consider that an in-cash match. Okay. Even though the university is paying for that. Um, if, it, if it's it's only in-kind, for instance, let's say it's a summer um, uh, contribution, and the, the faculty member is not contracted during the summer, and they say, I'm going to donate a week of my time to this project. Well, that's in kind because no money is being transferred. No money cut comes one way or the other by or through the university. So yeah, that's in kind. But if you're matching your salary, your effort, your time, uh, then yes, and the university is paying you for that time, then that's a cash match. You consider that cash. Yeah. So, but that that's different. I know some universities- It does vary. We, we consider it cash if it's, Cash that's not already budgeted, right? If it's already budgeted in our budget, and then we consider it in kind because we're paying them regardless. So it is, it is varies from your campus to campus. So you do need to verify how your university, you know, views that. Well, the, and and the reason why we do that is because a lot of grants want to know total costs for replication. You know, if somebody's looking at a project and wanting to do that in, in their area. They need to look at all costs are involved. So if a faculty member is donating some of their time while they're getting paid to uh, towards that effort, then they need to capture that amount and know what that cost might be. So that that's the justification behind that. And the time and effort reports kind of fall, you know, into this also. Um, yeah, we didn't even put that in here, but that is another. <laughs> Yes, I, another workshop. <laughs> that's another one in itself, exactly. Yeah. So next, I'm going to move on to indirect cost, and um, that that's something that I don't know if y'all, if 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 the other uh, research directors get this a lot, but PIs hear me about what this means, but.
but they don't want to get it. You know, they they feel like, you know, they wrote the grant, it's their project. Why is the university taking a portion of their money? Um, this, and I have to tell them, it's just something standard. It's something that every university, every um, organization that writes a grant has the opportunity to take this indirect cost. It's also called facility and administrative cost in some uh, cases. And these are costs that are incurred by the university as, um, as related to the grant activity. And examples of the cost include maintenance, depreciation, general and departmental administration, post office, utilities, operations, research administration, purchasing services, library operations, et cetera. Um, all of this is expenses that the university incurs and therefore they're able to, um, to re, um, capture these as um, money for doing business on the grant. Um, you should never request any of those items that I mentioned as part of indirect cost as part of your budget because they're not included um, in the, they're, they're already included in the negotiated indirect pool. So they should not be also expended um, through the requested budget. Um, <clears throat> you always include, this is how we feel, the maximum amount allowed of indirect cost on a grant. Um, every sponsor might have a different um, amount that they allow. So uh, you, should, you should adhere to whatever those guidelines are. And what we ask for when we're routing our proposals is we want a copy of what the indirects say on that particular grant. So we don't have to go and look it up and make sure that we're, we're getting the right amount. We know that that's what the sponsoring agency is allowing. Um, and of course, there have some sponsors that don't have a, a negotiated rate or don't, uh, you know, uh, indicate what that allowable rate is that we can take. Um, if that's the case, we have our own, I mean, they're not saying we can't take it, but they don't have a specific amount that we can take. The university has their own policy about what we will take, especially on smaller grants. We may not take our full indirect costs. We may take a, a smaller percentage. And sometimes it even can be negotiated within the university. Uh, uh, our um, finance uh, um, VP may allow us, if it's a small grant, to waive that indirect cost. But typically, we like to capture whatever we can on indirects. Um, there are some agencies, again, that do not allow you to collect any indirects. And if that's the case, we don't. Um, we, we adhere to whatever the sponsor says. Um, Each of our universities has our own federally negotiated indirect cost rate. And that's how we'll know the the general basic one in any almost all times when you're doing a federal proposal you can use that federally negotiated negotiated indirect cost rate because you'll have to attach a copy of it ours is based on salaries and wages i'm hoping to get that changed on our next um thing your, your business office or finance office as debbie mentioned renegotiates this rate every three years some some are allowed five years with their cognizant, cognizant, I love that word, agency. Um, and that is your federal agency that you have the most funding with. Um, ours, ours has been with HRSA. I know some are going to be NSF and, and different, but you negotiate that rate. And that rate's published, should be published on your office of sponsor programs website. Uh, they can tell you what it is. Some are based on total uh, direct costs and, and, it, and it varies. So the main thing, and like Debbie said, you want to get that back to the university. We've used some of that money that's that's recovered there for internal grants. Uh, our departments, it's split out. 50% goes to the department, 50% goes to administration in our area. And in the past, not now, they're using it off to help with the budget cuts. But in the past, we were able to fund 
internal grants for the university with those fundings. Uh, and as she said, some the U.S. Department of Education, for example, on a training grant, they will generally only allow 8%, but that's 8% of total cost. So you'll have to follow their specific guidelines. And talk about agent, our border regents enhancement programs, you cannot charge indirect costs there. So that's an example of one that doesn't allow the indirect cost. But like Debbie says at Nichols, you know, we negotiated here. We always want to get the max that's allowable because if they allow it, they understand that it is a real cost and it is the cost of doing business, you know, with us. Um, so that's if you have questions on that, that that's another topic that could be a whole conversation by itself. And, you know, with the budgets, the way that they have been, um, state budgets and university uh, expenses and uh, even um, the, the lack of students, you know, uh, registered at some of the universities, we need the extra revenue for just to manage the university. And so this is a reimbursable expense to the university to cover the actual costs that, um, you know, are, are allocated within any kind of grant that you, you know, that you- Our cost, <laughs> the cost of us. Our cost, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So now we're gonna look just some of the, hit on some of the budget highlights here. Um, yeah, so I, I'll speak to that budget development. It, you know, uh, you should always, when we're talking about budget, have a really good idea about what your, your end cost is gonna be. You know, for, for a lot of reasons. First of all, some grants have limits of what they would even fund totally. Um, and then they're also, uh, grants that have some specific things that are unallowable. So if you have a specific project cost for your, your proposal that you absolutely need or you can't execute your project, then you need to know that ahead of time. So that's why budgets are so important to be looked at and projected even before the writing begins. And the other thing is it the budget has to be very parallel and uh, aligned with the narrative. You don't want to not mention anything in your narrative and then have the reviewer find it in the budget line item, you know, like could be uh, uh, a drone, you know, you may have never mentioned in your narrative anything about a drone and all of a sudden there's a line item for a drone in your budget and they're like, what? You can't have that. Yeah. You know, so basically, that's it. It should do the budget first. I, I'm not saying in detail. I'm just saying you have to have a good idea of what your needs are in that budget. And also have that, um, that estimate from a vendor of what the potential cost is so that you know that you're not overdoing. I mean, they may have a, a, a limit on what you can spend on equipment. You know, you might not be able to spend over $10,000 on a piece of equipment. And if your equipment costs 50, it's, this is not the grant for you. So know that ahead of time before you even engage in the writing of it. And in, in saying that, we have a, a grants manager development person that recently retired that was with our nursing department. I think she... She was close to 60 years of being here and doing that. And, and I had a conversation with her one time years ago. And she said, when I want a grant, I just say, your idea is starting with the end of it. You think about the end of it. What, it, what do you want to end up with? What, what do you need? Uh, mm -hmm. We need this computer lab. Or what, are you gonna, what are those computers? So you, you start with the budget. And then your proposal narrative and all, that's the support of your budget. So they've got to tie together. Simpler the better. I'm gonna get it back to <laughs> don't put yourself in a corner. Don't put the name brands. Um, get a couple of quotes so you have some comparison idea. Go with the higher one uh, because the times of today. Look at today, especially if you're if you're budgeting for travel with the fuel cost. Um, so much variation right now. Smaller the better. That I think that kind of stays aligned with keeping it simple. You know, just keep it, keep it out, keep it where it's easy, easy relatable. Um, something that you know you can handle. When you get into complex 
uh, purchases, it can call it can take time, and especially right now, looking at deliveries and and things like that. So, do what you can with that. There's two parts to a budget. You got the budget form, which breaks the budget in specific categories. That's going to be your summaries of personnel, your summary of travel, your summary of operating services, your summary of surprise. The budget narrative explains how you arrived at these figures and why you need the money. It's it's just that. It's a budget narrative. Follow the format in the RFP. However that agency has their budget laid out, their budget categories laid out, do your budget format that way. Do your budget narrative the exact same. If equipment is listed last in your budget narrative, I mean, in your budget form, have equipment last in your budget narrative. That reviewer is going to sit there and they're going to have that side by side when they're looking at your proposal and they want to be able to go down it just like it is. So that's back to the keeping it simpler. Yeah, th this um, part about salaries and fringe rates um, it is important, if you can, to use the actual salaries and fringe rates of uh, those that are included in your budget. Sometimes it's a TBA position. You don't know who that individual is going to be on the grant, especially if you're starting a new program and you need to hire a director to manage the program. You might not know. And you can put an estimated salary in there or a range of salary you know, um, and estimated fringe rate. Again, if you don't know the person, you don't know exactly what that fringe rate is. But um, if, if, for instance, it's a grant like the Board of Regents grant, where you're writing it eight months before it actually gets funded, um, there's the possibility of not only salaries being changed, but also fringe rates being changed. You know, uh, fringe, um, for instance, retirement changes every July 1. Uh, and we just had a change. And actually, um, TRSL went down from 25.2 to 24.8%. And lasers just went down from 28.7 to 27.6%. So when it goes down, that's a good thing, you know. Um, but I, I, I'm going to throw this in, if it is a quick turnaround grant, let's say you are you apply for the grant one month and you know you're getting it the next month, you pretty much know your salary and your fringe rate then, and you, you probably should use exactly what it is. That way you don't run the risk of having to send any money back because we only charge what the actual rates are. You know, when we project in a budget some estimated rates, but when we when the controller's office goes to charge the grant, they charge the, the actual rates. And uh, again, we don't want to send anything back. In the same sense, you do want to try to be as close as you can because you don't want to run short either. Um, right. You'll have someone scampering to try to help find the money to cover that because you didn't include French or didn't include a rate high enough. So. Um, right. we, we have a rate posted that we asked everyone to use for the certain categories. And What is your rate? What is your estimated rate if you do? 30, 38. See, now, we, we definitely have someone who doesn't have health insurance. We can go, we'll go like 32. Health insurance is another factor that, that can really change it if they have family rate or if they have single rate or if they don't have health insurance. So, so let me ask you this, um, because if it we only charge the health insurance on uh, proposals where uh, they are 100 percent on soft money. Uh, our university, if it's a faculty member, they're only charging retirement and FICA meta FICA. We and, know it's our actual associated fringe with that position. Yeah, and so and part of their salary is being charged to that proposal. So y'all y'all are actually charging your um your insurance as well for your faculty. If it's a person that yes, the, okay. the the percentage follows the salary. And ours is just on soft money. So if we're estimating a new position that's going to be 100% soft money, we usually say 40% right and that makes sense yeah which those are far and few between with us we don't have we you know you try to avoid hiring anyone full-time on soft money so that is a rare instance okay uh 
follow your university policies. We you know, know what they are, know where to find them, check with your sponsor program's office, follow the agency guidelines. The agency will generally be less restrictive than the state of Louisiana, but just make sure that you are meeting everything. And then following that, I'm talking about the formatting. As I mentioned a while ago, follow their categories and the way that they have them, your scope of work. If just, you know, make it tied to your budget. Make sure that everything that you've got in your budget, as Debbie mentioned earlier, is in your scope of work. And then um, when it comes to matching, this is another uh, item that could be a full workshop as well. But um, some sponsors require institutional cost sharing and um, from the university or some sort of university commitment from the project. Um, but as Carla indicated earlier, do not include match unless it is required or encouraged. I mean, that again, it's something that once you put it in your budget, it has to be tracked. And we don't need that extra step if it's not a requirement. And, and, and basically, like for instance, NSF has uh, started saying, you know, they forbid you to put matching in there and, you know, in their grants, which I, I like that. That way the, the PIs don't have any um, uh, feeling that if I don't put it in, I'm not going to be competitive and I might not get awarded. Uh, you, you know right off the bat that it's it's not, you can't do it. Oh, so um, we definitely tell all of our PIs do not put it in unless they have to. Um, if there is a, a need to document um, these efforts on the part of faculty, um, you can do it in the proposal. Um, you can always write it in the narrative part of it. That doesn't uh, force us to actually um, track it in the end. Um, there's always a contribution of release time for which faculty is released from a teaching assignment that they can um, put uh, a match of their salary in that if they need to. Um, when a cash match is required, the principal investigator must first consult with the, the department chair. Um, anytime that you're trying to put cash from the university and you, you know, you need to, we require an email, a letter, something that says that they, somebody signed off on it. Some uh, budget unit head has said, yes, they can have this money. Um, we do have uh, at the university um, a pool of money where faculty can ask, and there's a um, one director that's in charge that they can appeal to this director for why they need a match on a certain grant and they will give them a cash match commitment. Um, I think we have like, uh, I don't know if it's 50 or $100,000 of potential match. Uh, the, the, the deal with that is though, if your grant is not funded, that's allocated and they can't reallocate that to somebody else you know, once they've committed to you. So the important part is, is that if you get a rejection to your grant, you need to let this department know immediately that your grant was re rejected so that they can release those funds and be able to match that on someone else's grant. Exactly, okay. We're running, running press. We'll, we'll put this in here. Integrity is doing the right thing, even if nobody's watching. Grant funds are, are audited. I mean, highly audited. You're talking about your tax dollars when you're talking about state funding and federal funding. So you don't want to be in the headlines of the newspaper for misappropriating, misusing grant funds. And that's kind of why we try to help you on the proposal side, set up your proposal for success and make it streamlined to follow if it's funded. That's why we're here. Use us for that. <laughs> Uh, faculty compensation grants, um, we've kind of covered that some. I'm not going to just know that you got your summer salary that can be a commitment if it's something, a program that's happening over the summer. That's a lot. That's most of what we do around here when it includes that. And then you've got your buyouts, release time. There's there's multiple terminology that's used across the institutions. You, there's policies in place at each of our institutions to follow when you're looking at doing these. 
So all grants have to be internally routed. And generally, um, it you have to follow your chain. Everyone in the chain needs to be aware that you are um, engaging in a possible commitment of your effort and especially your department chair, uh, your, um, your college, and then um, it goes through the university piece, the administration piece. So usually what we do on our routing sheet is we have them sign off by their department chair and then sign off by their dean, and then it comes to us. Uh, to the research and sponsor program office. And then we uh, look at the commitments, make sure that it's aligned with all the university policies and practices, um, and then get any other assurances that we might need before we move it forward. And then from us, it moves on to the provost who looks at it and also looks at the commitment, looks at if there's any um, extra um, pledge on the university's part, you know, in order to obtain the, the grant. Um, and they question that. And then from there, it goes on to the controller's office who um, that's our bean counter. And they're gonna look at not all the numbers, all the commitment. And I'm telling you, we, in our department, they do an excellent job of making sure that nothing leaves the campus until it all is added up and balanced perfectly. And quite often there's times between us and them and then us and then us back to the PI to get things changed or adjusted or whatever to make it make sure it's all completely perfect before it's fully internally approved. And once that happens, then it's we notify the PI and we say submit. It, we're, we're fine. Everything's um, satisfied by the university. Cheryl and I gave uh, a really in-depth um, internal routing uh, pres presentation on Tuesday. Uh, we're going to try to get those links put up to you too, and they are available in the Moodle site. But yes, I mean, you've talked about IRB, IRCA, uh, if you're going to have facilities and property management, if you're going to do any renovations, there are a lot of approvals that could be necessary. Um, so start that process early. We we request we ask to have the internal routing ten days here ahead of time. You don't have to have your final draft, but if, get your internal routing to us with a uh, abstract and a close budget or you know a preliminary budget for us to start working with you on. The sooner you get that, the too, more help we can give. I, I'll add this too, Carla, that if if PIs come to us early in the process, way before the 10 day routing process, if they come to us at the very beginning with their first ideas about this proposal, we help them work the budget out and, and help prevent any last minute problems with the budget that might delay them in getting the grant back to them in time to submit. So, you know, the earlier you work with your sponsored program office, on the budget, the easier it's going to be in the end. The better your proposal is going to be, and the stronger the proposal you'll have, because chances are we have sample budgets that were funded before from that agency, uh, may have full proposals. So the earlier you reach out to your sponsor program office, to, just the stronger your proposal is going to be. Okay. Um, Katie has put up a feedback link in there and asking that you please go in and give us a little bit of feedback on today's session. Well, also, she's also, I think, going to put the links in there to our number one and our number two session. If you'd like to, you know, grab those links real quick so that you'll have those and you can share them with your university, with your cohorts. The first one was just a basic grant writing. And then our grant writing power hour we did this past Tuesday is where we talked about the internal routing and things to be aware of in that. Uh, there's Debbie and my pictures and our our contact information please feel free to reach out to me anytime any questions the only question that's a bad question is the one you don't answer that you don't ask so our office sponsor programs on each campus are here to help you we have a cohort of us that we meet together we talk about things we share our 
our joys, our problems, our concerns, and and just a gripe session sometime about having to follow all these rules and regulations. <laughs> but let us help you with that process, and I hope that you'll join us. We'll, we'll have got two sessions next week, and you'll be seeing information coming out on those. I want to thank Debbie for joining me again. She's a wonderful co-presenter, and I'm so thankful and blessed to have her on here with us. Debbie, any closing thoughts? Uh, no, my pleasure to join you. Uh, Carla, you've always been such a great help to me, and uh, it's uh, wonderful to be able to bounce off some issues that are happening here and see how you handle them there. And it, uh, so, yeah, it's always good to be part of your team. So thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to have you. Okay, everyone. Well, if you, like I said, the, she's got the feedback up. She's got the two links up there, Neil, if you want to grab those and, and copy them so that you'll have access to those. They are available in the Moodle site, and we do certainly appreciate your feedback. Y'all have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.